up on growing pains, page 152. Mr. Freeman is a jerk. Instead of leaving me alone to find my muse, a real quote, I swear, he lands on the stool next to me and starts criticizing. What is wrong with my tree? He overflows with words describing how bad it stucks. It's stiff, unnatural, it doesn't flow. It's an insult to trees everywhere. I agree. A tree is hopeless. It is an art. It's an excuse not to take sewing class. I don't belong in Mr. Freeman's room any more than I belong in the Martha's or my little girl pink bedroom. This is where the real artists belong, like Ivy. I throw a linoleum block into the garbage can and throw it hard enough to make everyone look at me. Ivy frowns through her wire sculpture. I sit back down and lay my head on the table. Mr. Freeman retrieves the block from the garbage. He brings back the Kleenex box too. How could he tell I was crying? Mr. Freeman, you're getting better at this, but it's not good enough. This looks like a tree, but it is average and ordinary, everyday, boring tree. Breathe life into it, make it bend. Trees are flexible so they don't snap, scar it, give it a twisted branch. Perfect trees don't exist, nothing is perfect. Laws are interesting, be the tree. He has this ice cream voice like a kindergarten teacher. If he thinks I can do it, then I'll try one more time. My fingertips flip over the linoleum knife. Mr. Freeman pats my shoulder once and then turns to make someone else miserable. I wait until he isn't watching and then try to carve into my flat linoleum square. Maybe I could carve off all the linoleum and call it empty block. If a famous person did that, it would probably be really popular and sell for a fortune. If I do it, I'll flunk. Be the tree. What kind of advice is that? Mr. Freeman has been hanging out with too many new age weirdos. I was a tree in second grade play because I made a bad sheep. I stood there with my arms outstretched like branches and my head drooping in the breeze. It gave me sore arms. I doubt trees are ever told, be a screwed up ninth grader. Gag order. David Protraxa's lawyer had a meeting with Mr. Knack and some kind of teacher lawyer. Guess who won? I bet David could skip class the rest of the year if he wanted and still get an A, which he would never do, but you better believe that whenever David raises his hand, Mr. Knack lets him talk as much as he wants. David, quiet David, is full of long, drawn-out, rambling opinions about social studies. The rest of the class is grateful. We bow to the almighty David, who keeps the neck off our backs. Unfortunately, Mr. Neck still gives tests, and most of us fail him. Mr. Neck makes an announcement. Anyone who is flunking can write an extra credit report on a cultural influence at the turn of the century. He skipped the Industrial Revolution, so he could drag our class past the year 1900. He does not want us all in summer school. I don't want to see him in summer school either. I write... Should be answered. Thank you. Those announcements are going to be the end of me. I don't want to see him in summer school either. I write about the suffragettes. Before the suffragettes came along, women were treated like dogs. Just so you know, suffragettes, maybe you know, maybe you don't, was the women's rights movement, the original one. Okay. Women were treated like dogs. Women could not vote. Women could not own property. Women were not allowed in many schools. They were dolls with no thoughts or opinions or voices of their own. And then the suffragettes marched in full of loud, in-your-face ideas. They got arrested and thrown in jail, but nothing shut them up. They fought and fought until they earned the rights they should have had all along. I write the best report ever. Anything I copy from a book, I put in quotes and footnotes, feet and out. I use books, magazines, articles, and videotape. I think about looking for an old suffragette in a nursing home, but they're probably all dead. I even hand it in on time. Mr. Neck scowls. He looks down on me and says, to get the credit for the report, you have to deliver it orally tomorrow at the beginning of class. Me. There's no way I'm reading my suffragette report in front of the class. That wasn't part of the original assignment. 
Mr. Nick changed it at the very last second because he wants to flunk me or hates me or something. But I've written a really good report and I'm not going to let some idiot jerk, jerk me around like this. I asked David Petrakis for advice and we come up with a plan. I get to class early when Mr. Neck is still in the lounge and I write what I need to on the board and cover the words with a suffragette protest sign. My box from my copy shop is on the floor. Mr. Neck walks in. He grumbles that I can go first and I stand suffragette tall and calm. It is a lie. My insides feel like I've caught in a tornado. My toes curl inside my sneakers trying to grip the floor so I won't get sucked out the window. Mr. Neck nods at me. I pick up my report as if I'm going to read it out loud. I stand there, papers trembling as if a breeze is blowing through the closed door. I turn around and rip my poster off the blackboard. The suffragettes fought for the right to speak. They were attacked, arrested, and thrown in jail for daring to do what they wanted. Like they were, I'm willing to stand up for what I believe. No one should be forced to give speeches. I choose to stay silent. The class reads slowly, some of them moving their lips. Mr. Neck turns around to see what everyone is staring at. I nod at David. He joins me at the front of the room and I hand him my box. David, Melinda has to deliver her report to the class as part of the assignment and she has copies everyone can read. He passes out the copies. They cost me $6.72 at the office supply store. I was going to make a cover page and color it, but I haven't gotten my much allowance recently, so I just put the title at the top of the first page. My plan is to stand in front of the class for five minutes. I was given for my presentation. The suffragettes must have planned out and timed their protests too. Mr. Neck has other plans. He gives me a D and escorts me to the authorities. I forgot how the suffragettes were hauled off to jail, duh. I go on the tour of the guidance counselor's office, principal principals, and wind up back in this. I am back to being a discipline problem again. I need a lawyer. I showed up every day this semester, sat my butt in every class, did some homework. I didn't cheat on my tests. I still get slammed in this. There is no way they can punish me for not speaking. It isn't fair. What do they know about me? What do they know about the inside of my head? Flashes of lightning, children crying, caught in an avalanche, pinned by worry, squirming underneath the weight of doubt and guilt and fear. The walls and mists are still white. Andy Beast isn't there, thank God for small favors. A boy with lime-colored hair who looks like he's channeling an alien species dozes. Two goths in black velvet dresses and artfully torn pantyhose trade Mona Lisa smiles. They cut school to stand in line for killer concert tickets. Miss is a small price to pay for row 10, seats 21 and 22. I simmer. Lawyers on TV always tell their clients not to say anything. The cops say that thing, anything you say will be used against you, self-incrimination. I looked it up, three-point vocab word. So why does everyone make such a big hairy deal about me not talking? Maybe I don't want to incriminate myself. Maybe I don't like the sound of my voice. Maybe I don't have anything to say. The boy with the lime-colored hair wakes up when he falls out of his chair. Goth girl's Winnie. Mr. Neck picks his nose when he thinks we aren't looking. I need a lawyer. Advice from a smart mouth. David Petraka sends me a note during social studies. Typed. He thinks it's horrible that my parents didn't videotape Mr. Neck's class or stick up for me the way his folks did. It feels so good to have someone feel sorry for me. I don't mention that my parents don't know what happened. They'll figure out what happened soon enough at the next meeting with the guidance counselor. I think David should be a judge. His latest career goal is to be a quantum physics genius. I don't know what that means, but he says his father's furious. His dad is right. David was made for the law. Deadly, calm, turbocharged brain, and a good eye for weakness. He stops by my locker. I tell him Mr. Neck gave me a D for the suffragette report. David, he has a point. Me, it was a great report. You read it. I wrote a bibliography and I didn't copy from the encyclopedia. It was like the best report ever. It's not my fault Mr. Neck doesn't like performance art. David pauses to give me a stick of gum. It's a delaying tactic. 
the kind juries love. David, but you got it wrong. The suffragettes were all about speaking up, screaming for their rights. You can't speak up for your right to remain silent. That's letting the bad guys win. If the suffragettes did that, women wouldn't be able to vote yet. I blow a bubble in his face. He folds the gum wrappers into tiny triangles. David, don't get me wrong. I think what you did was kind of cool, and getting stuck in miss wasn't fair, but don't expect to make a difference unless you speak up for yourself. Me, do you lecture all your friends like this? David, only the ones I like. We both chew on this for a minute. The bell rings. I keep looking in my locker for a book that I already know isn't there. David checks his watch a hundred times. We hear principal, principal bellow. Let's move it, people. David, maybe I'll call you. Me, maybe I won't answer. Chew, chew, blah, 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 blow, bubble, pop. Maybe I will. Is he asking me out? I don't think so, but he kind of is. I guess I'll answer if he calls, but if he touches me, I'll explode. So a date is out of the question. No touching. The beast prowls. I stay after school to work on tree sketches. Mr. Freeman helps me for a while. He gives me a roll of brown paper and a piece of white chalk and shows me how to draw a tree in three sweeping lines. He doesn't care how many mistakes I make, just one, two, three, like a waltz, he says. Over and over. I use a mile worth of paper, but he doesn't care. This may be the root of our budget problem with the school board. God cackles over the intercom and tells Mr. Freeman he's late for a faculty meeting. Mr. Freeman says the kind of words you don't usually hear from teachers. He gives me a new piece of chalk and tells me to draw roots. You can't draw a decent tree without roots. The art room is one of those places I feel safe. My hum, and I don't worry about looking stupid. Roots, ugh, but I try. One, two, three, one, two, three. I don't worry about the next day or the next minute. One, two, three. Somebody flicks the lights off, my head snaps up. It is there, Andy Beast. Little rabbit heart leaps out of my chest and scampers across the paper, leaving bloody footprints on the roots. He turns the light back on. I smell him. Have to find out where he gets that cologne. I think it's called fear. He turned into one of those repeating nightmares where you just keep falling but you never hit the floor. Only I feel like I just smacked into the ground at 100 miles per hour. It. Seen Rachel? Rachel Bruin? I sit completely still. Maybe I can blend in with the metal tables and crumbling clay pots. He walks toward me, long, slow strides. The smell chokes me. I shiver. It. You're supposed to meet me here, but I can't find her anywhere. Do you know where she is? Me. It sits on my table. Its leg smears my chalk drawing, blurring their roots into a mossy fog. It. Hello? Anyone home? Are you deaf? It stares at my face. I crush my jaws together so hard my teeth crumble into dust. I am a deer frozen in headlights on a tractor trailer. Is he going to hurt me again? He couldn't. Not at school, could he? Why can't I scream? Say something. Do something. I'm so, why am I so afraid? Andy, I've been waiting for you outside. Rachel sweeps into the room wearing an artsy fartsy gypsy scarf skirt and a necklace of eye size mirrors. She pouts and Andy leaps off the desk, ripping my paper, scattering bits of chalk. Ivy walks through the door, bumping Rachel accidentally. She hesitates. She has to feel that something is going on. And then she takes her sculpture off the shelf and sits it on the table next to me. Rachel looks at me, but she doesn't say anything. She must have gotten my no. I mailed it over a week ago. I stand up. Rachel gives us a half wave and says, ciao. And he puts his arm around her waist and pulls her close to his body as they float out the door. Ivy is talking to me, but it takes a while before I can hear her. What a jerk, she says. She pinches the clay. I can't believe she's going out with him. Can you? It's like I don't know her anymore, and he's trouble. She slaps a hunk of clay on the table. Believe me, that creep is trouble with a capital T. I'd love to stay and chat, but my feet won't let me. I walk home instead of taking the bus. I unlock the front 
door and walked straight up to my room, across the rug and into my closet without even taking off my backpack. And when I closed the door behind me, I buried my face into the clothes on the left side of the rack, clothes that haven't fit for years. And I stuff my mouth into the old fabric and scream until there are no sounds left under my skin. Homesick. It's time for a mental health day. I needed a day in pajamas and eating ice cream from a carton, painting my toenails and enjoying trash TV. You have to plan ahead for mental health day. I learned this from a conversation my mom had with her friend Kim. Mom always starts acting sick 48 hours ahead of time. She and Kim take mental health days together. They buy shoes, go to the movies, cutting edge adult delinquency. What is the world coming to? I don't eat any dinner or dessert. I cough so much during the news. My dad tells me to take some cough medicine. In the morning, I smear some mascara under my eyes so it looks like I haven't slept at all. Mom takes my temperature. Turns out I do have a fever. Surprises even me. Her hand is cool, an island on my forehead. The words tumble out before I can stop them. Me, I don't feel well. Mom pats my back. Mom, you must be sick. You're talking. Even she can hear how bitchy that sounds. She clears her throat and tries again. Mom, I'm sorry. It's nice to hear your voice. Go back to bed. I'll bring up a tray before I leave. Do you want some ginger ale? I nod. Oprah, Salad, Jer Jesse, Jerry, and me. These class are uh, they're, uh, talk shows. And um, I don't even know if they're still on. I know Oprah is. But uh, Oprah would like interview people or does to this day who've maybe gone through hard things. Sally Jesse, I don't think is on at all. She used to do the, do the same thing, maybe slightly more dramatic. And Jerry Springer, like <laughs> trailer park, man. Like, I don't know where they find these people, but people fight on his show. People confess that they've been cheating or whatever. So, um, and it used to be what was known as daytime TV. I don't think you guys have that anymore, but we never used to like record stuff. We couldn't do that. Like, like we can today, we can record the shows we wanna watch. Um, couldn't really do that. So you just have to put up with whatever's on TV. And these three were on TV um, during the daytime hours, so anyway. My fever is 102.2, sounds like a radio station. Mom calls to remind me to drink a lot of fluids. I say thank you, even though it hurts my throat. It's nice of her to call me. She promises to bring home popsicles. I hang up and snuggle into my couch nest and remote. Click, click, click. If my life were a TV show, what would it be? If it were an after-school special, I would speak in front of an auditorium of my peers about how not to lose your virginity or why seniors should be locked up or my summer vacation, drunken party, lies, and rape. Wait, was I raped? Oprah, now she's pretending this in her head, okay? Oprah, let's explore that. You said no, he covered your mouth with his hand. You were 13 years old. It doesn't matter that you were drunk. Honey, you were raped. What a horrible, horrible thing for you to have to live through. Didn't you ever think of telling anyone? You can't keep this inside forever. Can someone get her a tissue? Sally Jesse. I want this boy held responsible. He is to blame for this attack. You know it was an attack, don't you? It was not your fault. I want you to listen to me. Listen to me. It's not your fault. This boy was an animal. Jerry. Was it love? No. Was it lust? No. Was it tenderness, sweetness? The first time they talk about in magazines? No, 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 no. Speak up, Melinda. Ah, oh, Melinda, I can't hear you. My head is killing me. My throat is killing me. My stomach bubbles with toxic waste. I just want to sleep. A coma would be nice, or amnesia. Anything to get rid of this. These thoughts, these whispers in my head. Did he rape my head, too? I take two Tylenol and eat a bowl of pudding. And then I watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and fall asleep. A trip to the neighborhood of make-believe would be nice. Maybe I should stay with Daniel Striped Tiger in his treehouse. Real spring. May is finally here and it has stopped raining. Good thing, too. The mayor of Syracuse is about to put out a call for a guy named Noah. 
The sun appears butter yellow and so warm it coaxes tulips out of the crusty mud. A miracle. Our yard's a mess. All our neighbors have these great mag magazine cover yards with flowers that match the shutters and expensive white rocks that border fresh mounds of mulch. Ours has green bushes that just about cover the front windows and lots of dead leaves. My mom's already gone. Saturday's the biggest selling day of the week at Efforts. Dad snores upstairs. I put on old jeans and unearth a rake from the back of the garage, and I start on the leaves suffocating the bushes. I bet Dad hasn't cleaned them out for years. They look harmless on the top, dry and on top, but underneath that top layer they're wet and slimy. White mold snakes from one leaf to the next. The leaves stick together like floppy pages of a decomposing book. I rake a mountain into the front yard, and there's still more, like the earth pukes up leaf gunk when I'm not looking. I have to fight the bushes. They snag the line tines of the rake and hold them. They don't like me cleaning out all that rot. It takes an hour. Finally, the rake scrapes the metal fingernails on damp brown dirt. I get down on my knees to reach behind and drag out the last leaves. Miss Keene would be proud of me, I observe. Worms caught in the sun squirm for cover. Pale green shoots of something alive have been struggling underneath the leaves. As I watch, they straighten to face the sun. I swear I see them grow. By the way, pause there. That is a symbol for the shizzle, okay? Her cleaning out this gunky yard, taking all the old leaves, all the old dirt and messiness, and then underneath this growth, okay? Just like Melinda, she's, she's struggling with what happened to her, and she has all this ugliness and bad memories and all those things, but underneath all that, she's still growing, okay? Pick it up right here. The garage door opens, and Dad backs out his Jeep. He stops in the driveway when he sees me, turns off the engine, and gets out. I stand up, brush the dirt off my jeans. My palms are blistered, and my arms are already sore from the raking. I can't tell if he's angry or not. Maybe he likes the front of his house looking like crap. Dad, that's a lot of work. Me. Dad, I'll get some leaf bags at the store. Me. We both stand there with our arms crossed, staring at the little baby plants, trying to grow in the shade of the house, eating bushes. The sun goes behind a cloud and I shiver. I should have worn a sweatshirt. The wind rustles the dead leaves still clinging to the oak branches by the street. All I can think of is that the rest of the leaves are going to drop and I'll have to keep breaking. Dad, looks a lot better, cleaned out like that I mean. The wind blows again, the leaves tremble. I suppose I should trim the back of the bushes. Of course, then you could see the shutters, and they need paint. And if I paint those shutters, I'll have to paint all the shutters. And the trim needs work, too, and the front door. Me. Tree. Hush, hush. Dad turns to listen to the tree, and I'm not sure what to do. Dad, that tree is sick. Look how the branches on the left don't have any buds. I should call someone to come take a look at it. I don't want it crashing into your room during the storm. Thanks, Dad. Like, I'm not already having a hard time sleeping. Worry number 64, flung tree limbs. I shouldn't have raked anything. Look what I started. I should have tried something new. I should have just stayed in the house. Watch cartoons with a double-sized bowl of Cheerios. I should have stayed in my room. Dude. I should have stayed in my room, stayed in my head. Dad. Oh, I guess I'm going to the hardware store. Want to come? The hardware store? Seven acres of unshaven men and bright-eyed women in search of the perfect screwdriver, weed killer, volcanic gas grill, noise, lights, kids running down the aisle with hatchets and axes and saw blades, people fighting about the right color to paint the bathroom. Uh, no thank you. I shake my head. I pick up my rake and start making my dead leaf pile neater. The blister pops and stains the rake handle like a tear. Dad nods and walks to the jeep. Keys jangling in his fingers. A mockingbird lands on a low oak branch and scolds me. I rake the leaves out of my throat. Me. Can you buy some seeds? Some flower seeds? Fault. Our gym teacher, Miss Connors, is teaching us to play tennis. 
Tennis is the only sport that comes close to not being a total waste of time. Basketball would be great if all you had to do was shoot foul shots, but most of the time you're on the court with nine other people bumping and shoving your way too much. Tennis is more civilized. Only two people have to play unless you play doubles, which I would never do. Rules are simple. You get to catch your breath every few minutes and you can walk on your, work on your tan. I actually learned to play a couple of summers ago when my parents had a trial membership at a fitness club. Mom signed me up for lessons and I played with dad a few times before they figured out the monthly dues were too expensive. Since I'm not a total spaz with the racket, Miss Connors pairs me off with the jock goddess, Nicole, to demonstrate the game to the rest of the class. I serve first, a nice shot with a little speed on it. Nicole hits it right back to me with, my great, with a great backhand. We volley, volley back and forth. Then Miss Connor blows her whistles to stop and explain the retarded scoring system in tennis where the numbers don't make sense and love doesn't count for anything. Nicole serves next. She aces it. A perfect serve at 90 miles per hour that kisses the court just inside the line before I can move. Miss Connors tells Nicole she's awesome, and Nicole smiles. I do not smile. I'm ready for a second serve, and I hit it right back down her throat. Miss Connors says something nice to me, and Nicole adjusts the strings on her racket. My serve. I bounce the ball a few times. Nicole bounces on the balls of her feet. She isn't fooling around anymore. Her pride is at stake, her woman, womanhood. She is not about to be beat by someone. Weirdo, hush, quiet, delinquent, he used to be your friend. Miss Connors tells me to hit the ball. I slam the ball, sending it right into Nicole's mouth, grinning behind her custom purple mouth guard. She twists out of the way. Miss Connors, fault, giggles from the class. A foot fault, wrong foot forward, toe over the line. I get a second chance, another civilized aspect of tennis. I bounce the yellow ball, one, two, three, up in the air like releasing a bird or an apple, and then arcing my arm and rotating my shoulder, bringing down the power and anger, and don't forget the aim. My racket takes on a life of its own, a bolt of energy. It crashes down on the ball, bulleting it over the net. The ball explodes on the court, leaving a crater before Nicole can blink. It blows past her and hits the fence so hard it rattles. No one laughs. No fault. I score a point. Nicole wins eventually, but not by much. Everyone else whines about their blisters. I have calluses on my hand from yard work. I'm tough enough to play and strong enough to win. Maybe I can get Dad to practice with me a few times. It wouldn't be the only glory of a really sucky year if I could beat someone at something. Yearbooks. The yearbooks have arrived, but everyone seems to understand the ritual but me. You hunt down every person who looks vaguely familiar and get them to write in your notebook that the two of you are best friends and you'll never forget each other and remember blank class. Hang on just a second, class. I'm going to pause this for just a moment.